قديم كان حجر مراتي بسيطا فإذا وعن القرآن حين اللانا لله ولا إله إلا الله والله أكبر ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. We welcome you all to this wonderful evening tonight with our esteemed guests Dr. Bilal Phillips as well as our traveling Imam Mashallah Sheikh Walid Abdul Hakim. We're really pleased and honored to have you both with us here tonight. It's a pleasure to have you here and Mashallah. This is, as you all know, this is a special gathering for volunteers and uh, students of Islamic online, online University. So it's a closed gathering. And the idea behind it is we wanted to have an open Q&A session with, with our shiuch here. It's an opportunity for you to have dialogue with them, to interact with them. And, you know, Dr. Bilal wants to update you also on what's happening on the IO, IOU side with, with you know, the university and the upcoming uh, updates of the university. And mashallah, he has certain plans that he would like to share with you. So um, can we see hands up of those of you who are students of Islamic Online University? Okay, so a few of them are there, inshallah. By the end of the evening, all of them will, inshallah, be <laughs> students, inshallah. So I'd like to start this evening by, um, you know, Asking a few questions, inshallah, if you don't mind, and we would like to keep it open. So, uh, first question goes to Dr. Bilal. Um, inshallah, would you just uh, share with us what your vision is for Islamic Online University? And, mashallah, you've done so much with the university already over the past seven years. There's more than 200,000 students registered in the university, mashallah. And um, we would like to hear what your plans are for the future and what your vision is for, for the university in the coming, coming five to ten years, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. The goal of the university is to change the nation, the ummah, through education. That is our stated motto changing the nation through education, which I feel, the university feels, is the ultimate way forward. As other options are being put out in front of young Muslims today, whether it is ISIS, Boko Haram, or whatever, these groups which are in fact deviant, deviated, extreme, harmful, are only able to propagate their ideas and find supporters, followers in circumstances of ignorance. Where Muslims are ignorant, then these ideas can take root. But where Muslims have a clear understanding of what constitutes Islam, what are the true Islamic teachings, you know, then these types of ideas will not take root. And we would not be suffering the kinds of damage that we currently have today globally. So, the Islamic Online University, though that wasn't the, the initial motivation, you know, to counter these groups, because when it started in 2007, they weren't around, right? They came up afterwards. But similar ideas were floating around in the community, whether it's through Al-Qaeda or whatever, you know, these extreme ideas were still floating. And being an educator from the time I graduated, uh, being involved in education on the secondary 
level, primary, secondary school, um, also at university, university professor for some 10 years, uh, setting up departments of Islamic studies, setting up universities on the ground, conventional universities. Uh, I felt that need, the need to, to convey the knowledge. You know, as the Prophet ﷺ had said, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَ That the, the real good is in the teaching. It's to learn, but what makes you the best or makes you among the best is the conveyance of that knowledge to others. So I felt it a duty uh, from the earliest stages of my studies to be engaged in da'wah because it's an element of da'wah. Teaching is da'wah, mm -hmm. you know, or it should be. So the Islamic Online University was to make the Sharia studies accessible to the, a, a greater audience in the world because studies traditionally being in Arabic uh, limited access most Muslims don't know Arabic what they know of Arabic is not enough to get them through any courses of study in Arabic and most Muslims do not have the opportunity to go to the centers in the Middle East in the Arab world you know and, and study in these universities and on top of that, for somebody to go and spend two years learning Arabic, then going and doing four years to do a bachelor's, for example, six years, and then they go home and they don't use the Arabic anymore. Because they go home to Canada, US, or wherever, you know, Malaysia, whatever, and they're not teaching in Arabic. So all of that effort which was made it is questionable. Is it really worth it? Mm -hmm. Is there not a shorter way? You know, so this is what I, I felt that uh, making this knowledge available through English mm -hmm. would be the shortcut for those people who were not uh, seeking knowledge in order to convey it in the Arabic uh, world. If you're going to convey it in the Arabic world or in an Arabic-based institution, then of course, yes, study it in Arabic. That is the, uh, and no doubt, studying it in Arabic is, has more depth. You will learn better and more when you study it in Arabic than if you study it in any other language. That goes without saying. However, uh, since one, it was not practical for most people today, and time-wise, it is very time consuming. This other route of the English presentation of the Sharia studies uh, seemed to me to be the best way to go. So I launched the Islamic Online University uh, seven years ago as a free diploma course uh, to learn the, me the mechan mechanics of running a university online. I started also the, um, the Islamic Studies Department in English for Knowledge International University in 2008. That gave me further understanding. And um, I set up a university in Chennai, bachelor's in business administration and Sharia. And in 2010, then I launched the university online. Mm -hmm. And realizing that the potential online to globalize that knowledge, the spread of that knowledge, you know, was so great. So much so that the university which I set up in Chennai, in, Ij in uh, Tamil Nadu, after four years of operation, the total student body is like 300 students. For our bachelor's program in the online, after four years, it was 4,000 students. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the kind of difference that online education made. And uh, the goals of the university now basically is to 
systematically offer the other major disciplines which the Muslim community needs, whether it's in the areas of education, area which is very neglected in many parts of the Muslim world that I've been to. I see very few Muslim teachers. In many places, they have to hire non-Muslims to put them in their Islamic schools and things like this. Uh, great need. Uh, also, areas of psychology. Muslims, generally speaking, don't study psychology. So many countries I went to and asked, you know, do you know a Muslim psychologist? Nobody could identify one. You know? But it is a very important area when you come into the area of counseling, etc., background. So like this, all of these important areas, uh, we try to add. So we already have, after Sharia, we've added uh, psychology, education, and Islamic banking and finance. And we are adding business administration and information technology by September. And so on and so forth, we'll be adding uh, more and more uh, disciplines which can be offered online. Uh, so our goal is to get that knowledge accessible from an Islamic perspective, because that's the whole unique thing that what we are offering, because otherwise you can go on the internet and pick up things in these other areas also. But conventional approaches are secularized. They're from the Western way of thinking and the ethics as well as the uh, understanding which comes from the guidance of revelation is missing. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to offer all of these subjects from an Islamic perspective, a comparative perspective in that the student will know what uh, is available uh, in the conventional presentations in the regular universities around the world, but then to understand why Islam approves of this much of that subject and why it doesn't approve of this much of the subject and what should be the Islamic approach to the subject. You know, so this uh, kind of uh, approach is what we want to spread in academia. Uh, we're also working on developing a similar approach in terms of Islamization to uh, primary and secondary schools uh, in different parts of the Muslim world. And alhamdulillah, my recent trip to Pakistan, we were able to set up a, a base in Karachi for uh, Islamic schools uh, to tackle this project of Islamization of the curriculum in the schools. Inshallah. May Allah reward you for your efforts. It's truly an inspiration to see someone, uh, you know, start up a project like this. And inshallah, you know, the, the objective of just connecting this to the overall vision of Falaq here uh, is that we invite such inspirational speakers to inspire our communities and our youth to, inshallah, have dreams and visions to do something on your own of that sort. You know? So, yes, we are inspired, but at the same time, Every single one of you should be asking yourself this question also is that, wow, that's amazing. What can I do to serve the Ummah? Inshallah. So this is something that I want you to keep in the back of your mind as we inshallah, continue the evening today and the coming uh, events tomorrow and the day after. Sheikh Walid, mashallah, you are uh, you know, known as the traveling Imam and we've heard that mashallah, you've traveled more than a hundred different countries across the globe. From, south, from the jungles of South America to Norway to you know, the villages of China. So tell us a bit about your experiences as you've traveled and also, mashallah, you're involved in education. Uh, you are one of the founders of uh, Ilm Path Academy and also an instructor at Al Maghrib Institute. Yes. Um, and you are also into life education, which is very much fits in line with what Falaq is also about. So please tell us about your experiences and also your vision uh, in terms of what you plan to do in the coming five to ten years. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Jazakumullah khair, my dear brothers and respected sisters in Islam. Alhamdulillah, it's an honor to be here with uh, Dr. Bilal Phillips. Uh, we were actually in Riyadh together in the 80s and 90s and then in Canada. We're both from Canada. Alhamdulillah, I'm always, it's always an inspiration to 
meet him and speak with him and see the progress. SubhanAllah, I've, last time I've seen him was in September and now we're already in March and I'm hearing all the news about the Islamic Online University and because of what I hear, it feels like it's been two years, not six months, alhamdulillah. So that's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's my first time in Bahrain, alhamdulillah. And mashallah, from what I've seen so far, alhamdulillah, uh, I did not know that the, the da'wah organization here, how far and advanced they are. Uh, I did not hear anything until I came here and then I visited the center for Discover Islam. And now I hear about uh, Falak TV, subhanallah, and the efforts that they're doing in the training here. So alhamdulillah, for me, that's the reason that I keep traveling. Because traveling is full of surprises. I, I, I travel to a country, sometimes invited to give a lecture, and I don't know much about it. And then I read the history of the country and the politics and everything before I go, and the geography. And then I discover all these inspiring da'wah projects, and I take notes. And as I learn about this, this is the inspiration because when I travel to other places, I mention the best that I see in every area. And then we as Muslims, we hear about these ideas and then we take them and implement them in our society. So it was more like a, a, a form of research to go to all these countries. And also it gives you the bigger picture of how the Muslim world is. When you visit, whether you visit Muslim majority countries or Muslim minorities in non-Muslim majority countries, you start to see what is the things that Muslims are doing good, what are the areas they need to improve in, what is lacking, what is the biggest challenges, what is the difference for, uh, of, uh, between the challenges that Muslims have in Canada and, for example, in Sweden or in Netherlands or in Japan? Okay? So you start seeing common themes and you start getting closer to knowing what's the solution for the problem through research, not just through guessing. And subhanAllah, I mean, again, Dr. Bilal Phillips talked about one of the major things, which is education. And Muslims they need both education of their religion to get to know their creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be better Muslims in this life and in the hereafter and they also need the life sciences and when we talk about life sciences there is the general fields that, that usually students go and study in university so they study uh, for example engineering or medicine or geology or physics or chemistry and all these fields after they study them they usually go on the track that everyone else is going around them, which is to find a job and get a family, and then what? And then they usually have, inshallah, they have a good life, but usually their, their career success looks like this. But then, when you take those same people, those same Muslims, and you give them training, you give them personal development training, or life skills training, or leadership training, you teach them how to put big, smart goals and how to achieve them. You teach them time management. You teach them communication skills, goal setting. Once you teach them these things and how to motivate themselves and motivate others, instead of seeing their career or success going like this, it starts going like that. And one of the things I studied as I was traveling and studying the histories of the countries is how nations succeed. And you can do this by studying the old history. So the Muslim Ummah, how did they reach the golden time in Andalus or in different eras? Okay. And the other nations that had success. And you can also look at the contemporary nations which are having success. And then you start seeing what is needed to be done. So when, and you're going to hear more about this, inshallah, in the lecture on Saturday night. But I studied countries like Japan, for example. Because Japan, I mean, there is other countries that are interesting around the world to look at. But Japan, the characteristic that they had is, number one, they don't have, they hardly have any resources. They don't have oil. Okay? They don't have enough land to do agriculture. It's a mountainous region. Plus, they were destroyed. They were destroyed not so far ago in World War II. And then they started from scratch again, not having these resources and being isolated from the rest of the world. And you fast forward to the 1970s and you start seeing Japan, the second biggest economy in the world. And you know, Japan is a small island country. Okay, not as small as Bahrain, but relative to 
many other bigger countries. Uh, Japan's, Japan's economy is equal to 36 U.S. states. So you start to see what did they do? And then you look at another country, Germany, well, that was also destroyed in World War II. What did they do? And then countries who were 10 years ago were not even in the top, like South Korea, for example. And now you look at them, they are from the top 10 economies in the world. And I'm not saying economy is the only way to measure the success of a nation. There is other factors, like the human development. And for us as Muslims, the most important thing is also the connection of people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then you derive common, common themes among these successful countries. What are they doing right that we as Muslims could benefit from? And so subhanAllah, after getting a degree in Islamic studies, I was trying to find what does my ummah need the most at that time. So when I started after taking the general studies in the BA, I wanted to see, uh, at that time, I felt that the books of hadith have not been explained enough. Like, for example, when you look at the, the science of tafsir, you see, alhamdulillah, the Quran has explained in the past, has been explained contemporary explanation. And I felt there was not enough work done, for example, to explain hadith for Muslims who are living today. We have, you know, Fatih al-Bari for Ibn Hajar al asqalani We have uh, Sharh of Imam al-Nawi for Sahih Muslim. And they are still some of the best resources. But at that time, I wanted to see what could be written for Muslims today. How can they use these ahadith in today's world, in today's challenges? Okay. So that was at that time. But subhanAllah, by that time I graduated and I got, at that time when I got exposed to the science of training and development, and after taking several leadership workshops, I started to notice the success in my life. And I said, subhanAllah, had I known these things 10 years ago, and of course we don't say low, this is from the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you know this at that time. But I'm saying, if only other Muslims would know these same things, how would their life look like? So then as soon as I finished my Islamic degree, I started a degree in training and development. That was in, in the US, in the Department of Communication specifically. That was my re the focus of my research, but mainly into training. Okay, that was the subcategory. And alhamdulillah, instead of workshops, I studied it from an academic point of view. And I saw how we could take the science of training and development and how we could advance that forward. And alhamdulillah, now what I'm doing in my PhD is I'm co trying to combine both, to have a curriculum for training and development from an Islamic perspective, from the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu from what the ulama did in the past. You can take any topic, like communication skills, like time management, okay? achievement, the science of achievement, and you look at the best of creation, the Prophet Wasallam, and what he did in his life to take those sahaba, okay? to take the sahaba who were, in the beginning, were weak and oppressed and living in jahiliya time, and within 23 years, make them lead the Arabian Peninsula, and then after that, lead the whole region. So we have also, alhamdulillah, we have rich material in our Islamic history, but we want to put it in a way that it is taught, this has to be a required subject in today's university, everywhere in the Muslim world, okay? in today's even schools. Okay? To teach the science of leadership, even for children in kindergarten, in the beginning, okay? so that they have these characteristics as they're growing from the beginning. And that's how, insha'Allah, we fast forward the success of this ummah. Okay. Just like the other nation, I say, insha'Allah, 20 to 25 years. If you look at Germany, Japan, all these nations, 20 to 25 years, even the Prophet Sallallahu it was what? 23 years. So I pray, insha'Allah, that our generation will be that generation that would restore the honor and izzah to Islam. And that's a brief summary of what I'm doing in my travels and in my research. Jazakumullah khairan. Mashallah, may Allah put barakah in your work and uh, it's really again very inspiring to see a sheikh who is mashallah balanced in his life so yes mashallah he has studied the uh, you know the Islamic education part but at the same time you know he realizes the importance of balancing with other skills that are necessary for someone to inshallah develop their careers further and you know I'd like to on the same note ask you Dr. Bilal how important 
life skills are in, in, a, in a Muslim's life and do you plan to add such content and such curriculums in your university inshallah in the future as well? Well, first I would just uh, like to add to what my brother Walid was saying, you know, about travel because uh, over a longer period of time I've traveled similarly from one end of the world to the other. Uh, he's done it in a fast forward version, <laughs> you know, but um, I have seen communities in their different stages and I think what that gives me is a positive overview. When I meet many Muslims in many parts of the world, uh, they tend to be very negative. You know, look at us, look at our situation. They, they can only see the negativities. You know, so I always have to tell them, listen, when you think what things are like now, think back 50 years. You know, what was the situation like then? We are far better off now than we were then. Our consciousness is far greater now than it was then. So there, a lot has taken place, but we are not able to grasp it because we are, we are just, you know, just grown up in it now. So it's just like a recent development. So you don't, you haven't really seen the past. You know, so I think this is a, that's what travel does, and this is why, you know, we try to encourage in the universities that I'm going to in different parts of the world, you know, exchange. This is what the West, they've done that quite a bit, exchanging students going from one part to the other. We don't have very much of that in the Muslim universities, exchange, student exchange programs. You know, but really needs to, for Muslims to get a better idea of what's going on in different parts of the Ummah, you know, in different places. So, um, that's just an additional point <laughs> to that. But uh, in terms of what you asked about, uh, life skills, of course the term life skills is a, is a bit maybe vague for me. I mean, uh, it seems to include a lot of different things. But um, if we say that ultimately it's about applying Islamic knowledge, applied Islamic knowledge, then this is what universities have to come to. You know, our goals in terms of studies in various areas, we have to talk to communities. I try to advise communities that, you know, as your young people are going into education, you have to guide them. You have to let them be focused. Right now, because of the uh, domination of, globe, of Western global civilization, on the world as a whole, on our world as a whole, then the goals of education uh, have become their goals. The goal of the dunya, to attain a good job, money, home, car, etc. You know, that's what it's all about. And university after university, when I asked in the medical colleges and the engineering colleges, you know, why, asking the students, why are you here? Why are you studying medicine? Invariably, they're studying medicine and studying engineering because this is where the money is. You know, that's where you're going to make your most money. So that becomes the driving force. So with people with that kind of mentality, we can't make a change. Furthermore, one of the tests which I, I put into uh, practice when I went to schools as well as universities, I would ask the students, you know, one of the universities which is known as the most, one of the most Islamic, you know, modern universities in Pakistan, you know, I, I asked them, uh, those who can put your hand up swearing by Allah that you have never cheated in any examination throughout your course of study. And invariably, 400 students, one sister puts her hand up. 300 students, one brother puts his hand up. I say to them, well listen, you know, in Pakistan one of your biggest problems is what? Corruption. Right? Corruption. 
So now, do you think at this rate that you will be able to change that corruption? No. No. You will just be a part of the problem, not the solution. So the issue now of bringing morals back <coughs> into education becomes a huge challenge. And I'm saying that to say, I will leave the motivational stuff to you guys. I mean, I focus <laughs> this other big area, huge area, yes. which is a problem from kindergarten to PhD. You know, that this bringing morality back into education, back into every class, every subject, is a huge challenge. But it can be done. So my focus is on the practical side, you know, because we want people who are graduating with a holistic view of Islam. They are properly groomed Islamically. They have been raised Islamically so they can benefit the community. And I tell them, for example, even when they're going to study, I say, you know, don't go into fields wherein the only place you can practice it is in the West. You're here in Pakistan, you're here in Malaysia, you're here in, you know, Jordan or Gambia. Look at the need of your country and make sure that what you study is what is going to benefit the country. Otherwise, you are part of the brain drain. They're just pulling you out and using your brains to build their civilization, you know. So, my focus is motivational also, um, trying to make uh, Islam that way of life that we always speak about. Islam, the way of life. We always speak about it. I, from the time I first became a Muslim, I heard it being said till now. But Slogan. making it real, you know, how does it actually become a way of life? Then there must be this moral undercurrent, there has to be this uh, Islamic approach to education which can then create a change, a real change. Because with those individuals and then motivated as you all are concerned with, you know, utilizing skills that have been developed by Western uh, motivators, which have Islamic application, you know, utilizing that, we, we need, wherever the knowledge is, wherever it is beneficial, you know, we would like to, to have it. But uh, the primary focus, to be quite frank in ours, is to at least establish those basic areas before going into that level, focus on laying down clear, basic programs so that people who want to go into these different areas of learning, they have an alternative, an Islamic-oriented uh, or Islamic-directed alternative. Zakallah khair. So since uh, I'd like to remind the volunteers, by the way, that feel free to ask questions. We have mics on the floor, so if you have any questions, uh, any hands up for any questions, please can we pass on the mic? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, I forgot the plural, sorry. Anyhow, uh, uh, Sheikh, I had a question uh, to Dr. Bilal Phillips, which was, uh, uh, what hurdles do you face, say, when you, you just set up something in Pakistan, the base for, say, uh, an Islamic-oriented school? So, uh, could you give us an idea, a little scale of how, you know, the, uh, you know what hurdles you would face? in doing that. For example, even in a Muslim country, there are certain factors that perhaps we face as difficulties. So could you give us some ideas on how to uh, deal with those, if possible? The hurdles faced in? Trying to establish an Islamic school. You know, well, the, this, this may vary from country to country, you know. Um, what I have focused on are the existing schools. People have already made efforts. Virtually everywhere I've been to, people have set up Islamic schools. There's a, yes. there's a, this is part of the, the current awareness 
consciousness. Muslims realize it's necessary to develop an alternative. But the main problem with that alternative is that we are approaching it uh, from a secular perspective, uh, which came out of Christian uh, thought from Middle Ages, where they attributed to Jesus the statement, leave unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. So when they did that, they separated between the religious knowledge. So the missionary school which came, was set up in our countries, you would study um, uh, Bible studies, you learn the prayers, uh, Christian things, and then after that you go study your math, science, etc. You know, you had, those are in one packet, is in another packet. And that's what we have done. The, the Islamic schools that I saw, or institutions, they taught what they call, for example, in, this, in, in, in uh, Pakistan, they call it Islamiyat. You know, you had some Quran, you have some Islamic studies, you know, uh, some Arabic. That's your Islamiyat. And then after that, you have the other subjects, which are as they are. So the idea of integrating that the Islamic uh, knowledge and perspective is integrated into those other areas, this is the challenge. Because it is only at that point that the school truly becomes an Islamic school. You know? So it is how to go about doing it. Uh, this is the big hurdle for Muslim schools to come together. Because individual schools I've talked to you know, for years, I've been talking this talk for the last 15 years, you know, individual schools, and they may do it to this degree or the other degree, but what it needs is actually a coming together of the schools, sharing their experience, taking the best, and building something, you know. So, uh, this is the big challenge, and ultimately it is in producing our own textbooks, so that we have our own O levels and A levels. You know, which becomes a, gl a global standard, which becomes acceptable. We have our own textbooks for it, mm -hmm. you know, which countries will recognize. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I did the 56 book Iman reading series for English, Islamizing English readers for pre kindergarten up to grade three, just to show what can be done, you know. But though I did it, finished those. Uh, six years, uh, back in 1998, you know, since then, nothing else has been done. Nobody did science, mm -hmm. nobody did maths, nobody did, you know, geography or any of the other subjects. So, of course, I still keep trying to push at it. This is the struggle. Um, I've taken another approach rather than going straight to the books, because the books requires really institution that will uh, do that on a big scale, uh, taking it down to the level of the classroom, as they say, where the rubber hits the road, mm -hmm. you know, the classroom. Let's get right into that classroom, and the most basic tool is the lesson plan. So we say, let's go to that lesson plan. I develop five points to Islamize that lesson plan. So no matter what you're teaching, we can say it has been Islamized. So this is the program I presented in the Pakistan. Uh, alhamdulillah, we got uh, about six schools together. We in intend to increase and to take on this project and make September, uh, August for them there, the, the implementation of that across those schools, uh, starting from August. But from now, they have start to prepare the teachers for it how to get the resources, etc., necessary to, to make this project a reality. And I should just also add, too, that uh, one of the things that we're working on Islamic Online University is setting up also an international Islamic online homeschool. I mean, we want to launch it by September, and we wanted to launch it by last September. Oh, pray that we'll manage to do it by... The, the next September, inshallah. inshallah. But the idea being that there are many parts of the world, Muslim world, and non-Muslim world where Muslims are in large concentrations, where 
there is no hope of setting up an Islamic school. Communities are too small, small too poor, or whatever, while uh, internet becomes more and more accessible, uh, entering each household, as the Prophet ﷺ predicted with regards to Islam, inshallah, following that internet into every household. From the sisters, any, any questions? We would like this session to be interactive so you guys don't fall asleep. So please, be very, we have one question there. Please, if we could get the mic. Assalamu yeah. alaikum. Uh, Dr. Bilal Phillips, uh, regarding, you, you mentioned something about the primary and secondary. My concern is children are so negatively affected in the schools they go to. How about having a program that is for children that on their own, they're able to have access to, you know, attending similarly to what IOU students are doing, but of their caliber, like talking about the prophetic stories and building, the main aim of IOU is bringing all those madhabs under one umbrella. So when you develop children, from a young age with one concept, with one belief, and with one idea across the globe, the ummah can be united. So like you just mentioned, every home has an access to internet, but programs for children, basically, where parents can help them, because what they learn at a younger age, <clears throat> excuse me, it's more instilled in them, comparatively what they would, you know, learn in schools and so on. That was my concern. Well, as I mentioned, the Islamic Online Homeschool, this is what the purpose is, is to provide for children, but children need help. You can't say just put the children in front of a TV, you know, a, a computer screen and say do your, at a certain age, once you get into high school and that, yes, but children in grade one, pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, uh, what are they going to do? You know, you need to, they need to be guided. They need guided study. So it's the parent, the mother and the child working together, program designed to guide them through studies which they would normally have done if they went to uh, Islamic uh, schools, they can do it from the home. So this is what we're currently working on, inshallah. You want to add anything to that? I think we have another question there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's me. Assalamu alaikum, uh, my name is Abdul Aziz. I'm originally from Pakistan. Uh, I'm a journalist by profession. My question to both of you, since both of you are educators, and uh, especially to Sheikh Bilal Phillips, do you intend to include media studies in your uh, university programs? Because uh, as, we, as I see it, media is a very big power that we Muslims have neglected for, for a long time. And every time someone does a stupid act, it's always put in a basket of deeds, and we, we tend to go on the back foot just because we don't have a media outlet that can defend our Muslims. I mean, we see that there are Muslim outlets, but they're really, I mean, worse than the, 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 the Western outlets, the media outlets. So don't you think that we need to focus on this as well? Absolutely. Uh, for the last year, we've been trying to find uh, people who would uh, prepare a course in Islamic media, journalism, mass communications, but finding committed Muslims in this field is like finding a needle in a haystack. It's the problem that we're faced with. Uh, those people that are in it, you know, you see them, they got ponytails on their heads and, you know, they're, they're not really going to benefit in that way. So, but we are looking and if we find people with qualifications who can uh, launch a bachelor's in mass communications, media, um, journalism, these are priorities. I agree with you 100%. Um, Alhamdulillah, I mean, uh, I think me and Sheikh, we spoke about this a few months ago that uh, uh, to start the mass communication because uh, if you look now, that's the challenge that Muslims are having that other people are speaking on their behalf in many parts of the world and it doesn't matter how much Muslims try to present themselves 
even on social media and others. And alhamdulillah, there was some success, but the people who have the keys to mass media, they are the ones who are changing the opinions of people about Islam and about other things. Um, and inshallah, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in the near future, Islamic online universities and others will teach Muslims about the communication and mass media so that they become effective in this. We, we do have a few Islamic channels. Uh, the Arab world has had some for a while. And in the Western world, there has been a few so far. But the, even when you analyze those few, you see that mostly it's still focused on Muslims in a broad sense. And we need to increase the number of these mediums to have different areas of focus. So we need to focus also, we need a channel to focus on non-Muslims. We need one to focus on the people who are, want to learn knowledge to a higher level, for example, not just the general. Today, when you, when you even uh, listen to most of the talks, whether on YouTube or online, you see that it's mostly, it's the uh, hard softener topics. Okay? But something with a higher knowledge cap, and I believe Dr. Zakir Naik as well, Alhamdulillah, he started Peace TV, and it had that reach mainly in, in Asia and around it still. Um, in other countries, people reach it through the internet or other mediums. But even though in those few years, the success that he had, that could be amplified by producing more Muslims who are specialized in the science of media. Any more questions from the volunteers? Yeah, we have one there. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, my question is both of the Sheikhs that uh, in like in learning, like when you when you grow up and you have the main role is your parents and like what you suggest us how we can like how we can uh, improve. Like how we can talk to our parents in going and learning Islamic institutes and instead of going in universities like different universities and how we can change the thinking of our parents. Like I'm independent, I can talk to my parents but most of the students who did graduate from the school, they are 16 and 17 and they are forced by the parents to go to the universities which are non-Islamic. So will you like have some suggestion on this? I think practically speaking, I always advise young people when dealing with parents to get the help of other people from their own age group. Because the dawa of children to parents is mostly not accepted. Younger to the elders. They don't the elders can't seem to hear it. When you stand and you talk, even though you may be a graduate, you're married, you have a few kids, you try to talk to your parents, they're still looking at you as that baby in nappies. You know, it seems like only two years or so ago we were changing your nappies. Now you're coming to tell us about life and <laughs> these big topics, you know? I mean, that's the kind of, uh, you know, mentality. This is the psychology of the elder. So it's better to get somebody who is from their age group, who, has, who is more enlightened, who can understand what you're trying to convey, and let them carry the message, because you will see it. Uh, they will come and talk to your parents in front of you, and they will say the same things that you've been saying to your parents. The parents will say, really? Yes, <laughs> you know, we agree with that. That makes sense, you know. <laughs> yes, and then you see, look at that. I've been telling them the same thing all these times, <laughs> you know. But that's just the way it is. And then if you consider Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who gave da'wah to uh, the Quraysh there for 13 years in Mecca, you know, as is said, not a single relative of his who was older than him accepted Islam from him in 13 years, and here is the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with his miracles and not a single one accepted. So this is telling you something. 
You know? Of course, Allah could have made it happen, but Allah let it be. This is a lesson to us in, in nature and psychology that we learn from and adapt our da'wah accordingly, inshallah. I think one of the concerns, uh, Sheikh, that uh, a lot of students have, and I've seen this myself, is many students end up going to universities in Saudi where they end up getting a Sharia degree, studying for four years or seven years, and then they come back and the only job they get is either a mu'adhin in a masjid or an imam of a masjid or a khatib in Jum'ah. And so their breadwinner role gets severely affected. And they end up suffering from, from this uh, career path that they've chosen to take. And they're just stuck in a hole. And I've seen this over and over and over again. So what went wrong in that decision? And how would you know, students who want to pursue an Islamic education, what advice would you give to such, such students to avoid such... Uh, Consequences. consequences yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, I think that is a minority, really. The majority are children who were pushed into various areas of medicine. Why are you going to medicine? My father was a doctor. My grandfather was a doctor. It's like, every, you've got to be a doctor. No choice in the matter. So they're forced into areas of study which they may not even be interested in. They want to go and do Islamic studies. It's usually it's the other way. I think it's more this case than the, it is the case of those who go over and study and come back and are not effective. I mean, that is a problem too. I agree with you. But the bigger case is, you know, not having a clear direction. Parents not being clear themselves. Parents thinking in the same Western approach that it's about getting a good career. That's going to earn you good money. You have a nice life and this. So that is their focus. You know? Whereas you, as young people now, you've gotten some sense of awareness. You've been working with you know, Falak and uh, Discover Islam, whatever. And so you're motivated. You want to do something for Islam. And they're forcing you into these fields. You know? this, is a, this is a struggle. Uh, how to deal with that. Of course, as I said, this area requires other elders to talk to your parents in general. Because for you to try to convince them to let you take your own course instead of what they feel is best for you, it's not going to be very easy. You know? And um, again, uh, it is better because of course, in your enthusiasm, maybe everybody wants to go to Medina, but reality is everybody's not going to Medina. It's only a fraction. So we have to also be practical. You know? Um, you are sometimes students who are in their second year of medicine, they come and they tell me, you know, listen, this medicine thing, uh, man, I really don't, I'm not really that interested in it. I want to be, you know, a scholar. I want to go to Medina. So, brother, you already put in so many years. Better you finish this. I mean, if really you hate it, that's a different situation. If you really hate it, but it's something you can do, but you have this new passion because, you know, you've been, you know, you've been set on fire now. You want to go to Medina. It's good. The knowledge in Medina is good. You can, you can get it whilst you're doing your area. You know, it's better to have a conscious, a Islamically conscious Muslim doctor. Uh, you have the chance to do it because the majority who are going through are not going to be Islamically conscious. Then for you to join the ranks of the thousands that are going to Medina to study. Really, in terms of the benefit to the society, it will be much better. You know, so this is where, alhamdulillah, Islamic Online University provides the means for people to continue in their disciplines, whether it's be engineering, you know, or medicine, or whatever other field, and they can still continue to increase their Islamic knowledge. Because, again, when you're going to go running off to Medina, you have to think, what are you going there for? You know, are you going there just so you can come out and be sheikh, you know? Sheikh who graduated from Medina, you add Madani at the end of your names, you know? You know? I'm so and so Madani. Is, is that what it's about? Because really, when you come back here and you're going to do work in the community, you're not talking to Arabs, you know? 
So the Arabic that you spent all that time struggling to learn so you can study this, you're coming back here and you're going to teach wudu in Urdu. <laughs> you know, what was the point of all of that? You know, so we have to be practical. Really, what is it that you want to do? Where do you really want to be? You know, and then you choose your field accordingly. If I may add to this because I've also been in this situation where when I, when I first, the first thing that I studied was architecture okay, because my parents wanted, of course, to, uh, me to be an engineer, alhamdulillah. And then um, I did it, I did the major and I loved it, alhamdulillah. But I, I didn't see myself uh, doing this for the rest of my life. I felt like my passion is in something else. Um, and when I communi communicated this to my parents that I wanted to study Islamic studies, there was of course friction, even though my father has graduated from Al-Azhar. And he, subhanAllah, he himself is an Islamic graduate, but still he wants me to continue on that path. And then Alhamdulillah, through communication eventually, and mainly when parents do this, they do this out of love because they think you may struggle in your life if you study and then you cannot find a job and how much would an imam make or something, subhanAllah. Uh, but again, we all trust that the rizq is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I started to study Islamic studies and then after I graduated and there was that point which is what's next? Where am I going to take it from that moment? And I had a chance after doing the degree in Saudi to go back to the US. And that's when I started to feel the responsibility. The responsibility of Islam, especially in the world after 9-11, and how the Muslims were, are, who live there were starting to get away because of the pressure. Pressure from the media, pressure from the society and all that. And it started all when I went to a small town and there was not even Jum'ah being done over there, subhanAllah. And then had to establish this from scratch with the other students over there. And then by that time, I realized if I wanted to continue on the path of da'wah, I will have to have other qualifications. And so always when, we, when I get this question, should I study Islamic studies or should I study uh, my other degree studies? And I often say, why choose? It's just a matter, you can have both, but which order you study in? Should I do my Islamic degree first? Should I do my other uh, studies first? That's something that it depends on each person's circumstances. If you know that you need finances, then perhaps it might be the best choice to study your general studies first and then do the Islamic studies. Okay? Uh, but. At the same time, what I encourage everyone who goes into Islamic studies to do is you must study business skills. Because once you have good business skills, you are not tied down by anyone or anything. You know, if you get your degree in any field, most of the people will become employees. And when you become an employee, you only have limited control in your life. How much time you have after you do your nine to five. You cannot move or do anything without the permission of your boss. Okay? So if you have to be an employee, no problem. There's nothing wrong with that. But always have a long-term plan or an exit plan. Okay, I'm going to be an employee for three years. But by the third year or fifth year, I will have the skills to start my own business. And once you have your own business, you know how to get money in this life. That's a skill that they don't teach in school. Because school mass produces people who will be employees okay? for the other, for the big companies and corporations and the government and all that. Okay? So you'll see limit, this is taught in schools in a very limited way. And this is where we're talking about success skills and life skills and business skills. But you look at the hadith of Prophet ﷺ that tis'atu ashar rizq fi tijara, that nine-tenth of the rizq comes from tijara, from business. And you look at someone like Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him, and he was the example. He was very successful as a scholar and a student of knowledge earlier and very successful as a businessman. Okay? And we will talk, inshallah, in tomorrow's lecture about uh, by time, the time management. I will show you more details into the life of Abu Hanifa, how he was 
successful, extremely successful in both. That even though he was a full-time scholar, he also sponsored over 30 of his students from his own pocket. That they would be focused on learning from him. So when you have that, inshallah, then it doesn't matter. You will not have that image of the poor imam who is, uh, have this. Uh, no, alhamdulillah. You will have your business skills. You will have control of your life. You start a small business, and then once you succeed, you know how to give it to someone who will take care of it. And now that you have a, a flow of income, you are free to do whatever projects you want in your life. Study Islam full-time, travel full-time, um, start projects and then train people to manage that project and move on to something else. Dedicate your life for a single project like Sheikh Bilal, Dr. Bilal is doing right now. Okay? The, 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 uh, the possibilities are limitless. Once you free yourself from the shackles of money and time, then you can be the best Muslim that you could be, inshallah, for yourself and for your ummah. جزاكم الله خيرا. Going into the personal lives uh, a bit, you know, being full time. You, you have a question there? Yeah. Who has a question? Yeah. Can yeah. we? Yes. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, can you please suggest us some best and easy ways how to acquire Islamic knowledge? and get ourselves involved in dawa without neglecting our family responsibilities, being as a mother or a wife. Jazakumullah khair. Well, I think that um, the Islamic Online University and other online universities, you know, provide that circumstance for the housewife. Without having to leave her home, she can continue to study. She can download the material, listen to it using MP3 player while ironing, while doing other things, so she can continue to uh, fulfill her needs of the home needs at the same time continuing her study. And also uh, sharing that knowledge. The da'wah comes through sharing of the knowledge. In Islamic Online uh, University, all students are required to complete a, a set of hours every semester, you know, of community service. Basically, they have to take some of that knowledge back into the community in one way or another, uh, whether it is circles for the sisters in their home, or they work with some charitable organizations, or Dawah organizations, etc. You know, but they, everybody has to put in a certain number of hours, and this becomes training uh, in sharing that knowledge with others. So Islamic Online University represents an, an option. There are also uh, it's, uh, un, uh, institutions, centers that are offering uh, courses, and you can take these courses too. Maybe it's on the weekends, whatever. Uh, just the key just to be consistent if you're consistent over a period of time you will be able to gain sufficient knowledge to be able to benefit others but uh, today in comparison to 50 years ago 100 years ago there are endless opportunities that are available it, and um, really no one has any excuse today when the Prophet Sallallahu told us that seeking knowledge was compulsory for every individual, uh, nobody can say how, you know, we have so many means available to us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, um, uh, Sheikh, it's, uh, it's an honor to be in your presence, uh, to be sitting in your presence, and Jazakumullah uh, khairan for uh, visiting us in uh, Bahrain. Um, I had registered in uh, IOU um, for the diploma course and um, uh, a major challenge that I had faced was um, that what I was learning, um, uh, the thing is uh, there's no memorization um, involved and I think that's the problem or I don't know what the problem is but um, I didn't know exactly how to approach the course 
and I was just learning, reading uh, through the PDFs and um, just giving the exams and I would pass. Um, but um, after a few months, I wouldn't remember anything. I mean, if I was to take the test again, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, be able to uh, pass, I think. So um, what is the correct approach of um, um, learning at uh, IOU um, uh, so that we may retain the, the knowledge even after years? So um, could you guide on that, please? Zakallah khair. Well, I don't think this is specific to online study. If you go into a classroom, you get information taught by the teacher. It's written in your book. One month later, if you are questioned on that material, you will be in the same position, same place. So this is not something unique to online study. It's really taken care of by modes of study. How do you study? You know, scholars, educationists, have worked out a pattern where they show you that if you study something today, you need to review it tomorrow. Then you need to review it again next week. And you need to review it again. And that way, when exam time comes, it's just a light review. But what we are used to doing, and that's how we have studied all along, is that we just go through the material briefly, just skimming, and then when the, the night before the exam, you take out your books and then you cram for your exam and you pass. That's what you did all the way through school, isn't it? Right? So you go back and I ask you about that stuff you learned in chemistry and you know, you, now it's zero. It's gone. So this is not unique to online study. It's just unique to study in general. So you have to develop a proper revision habits in order to retain it. Even when you enter into a tahfiz program, uh, the teacher he teaches you a page. You have to review what you did yesterday. You also have to review what you learned a month ago and also from your early hifth so that you know, you're reviewing sections so you have a series of reviews going on. Maybe three or four different reviews at different levels of your learning going on. So that system which was devised for the memorization of the Quran is the same system in a simple, more simple version you know, which you need to retain any uh, body or re uh, area of knowledge that you're learning. And one of the advantages that the online university has, online study has in general, is that if you are in a classroom and you, you, you studied a class with a teacher and 50% of it you didn't understand, you can't go to the teacher after the class and ask the teacher to repeat the class for you. Right? That is unthinkable. But online, with the online program, you can play that lecture over again and over and over until you've gotten everything that is there. You can do that. Will you do that? That's the question. You know, you figure you did it, done, you've gone to the next one, right? You know? So you do your test because that's why we have the test after every lecture. Check yourself. When you do that test, maybe you only got three out of five right, but you passed and you went on. But really, you're advised to go back over again. If you didn't get 100%, then it means that you really haven't grasped the fullness of that subject. So the advice is there. So you want to take the advice, then your knowledge will be firmer, more solid. If you don't, if you're just looking to pass, just as you did in your secular studies, all the way through school, then why expect anything different? As I say, if you keep doing the same thing, you'll get the same results. Sheikh Walid, would you like to add any knowledge retention tips for the students here? Well, Sheikh Bilal, he summarized uh, what we need to do, which is the, um, the retention and to, to increase the way you learn something, because sometimes we only use one sensory to learn. So we either learn by listening, which is audio, or by seeing something, or by actually doing, touching. So the more methods you use 
in learning, the more you can retain. So in addition to listening, you can also write down the content and make the notes in your own way and organize the information according to how your brain processes information. People process information differently. Some people process information, they need it to be written in different colors. You make your own notes that way. Some people like to make points, one, two, three, four, five, and remember it as that way. Some people, believe it or not, the very visual ones, they actually draw what diagrams and mind maps. Okay? There are so many techniques of, of retaining the information, but for each person, there is a way that works better for them. And the more ways they do, like for example, if you're memorizing Quran, you can put the, the Quran on ultra repeat, page by page, rather than a full surah. And it will be what? If you're driving half hour in this traffic, each, each page is two minutes, so you have listened to it 15 times. And you can remember it even with the tune. So that's one way to memorize the Quran. The other way, sit down and write the ayat. Write every ayat 10 times. Okay? And looking at the page, looking at the page, and you remember exactly how it would look like as well. So you've taught yourself in three ways. So instead of your retention percentage being 20%, it will, inshallah, be 80%. And with the way the Sheikh said, the review, you review, uh, you review in one day, in one week, and in one month, then you can reach what the retention rate, inshallah, you get it closer to 100%. Zakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Sheikh, if I may be permitted, I have two questions and I would be more on specifics. Like, I come from a background of finance. My name is Sayyid Faiz Muntakha, by the way. I'm from Hyderabad, India. And uh, I'm educated in conventional finance and my ultimate goal is to do PhD in Islamic finance. And uh, what paths should I take? Uh, I need uh, some guidance on that. Uh, my second question is uh, that I'm a father of a 10-year-old child. Uh, I got an opportunity to put the child in a school uh, where uh, they provide Islamic education with secular education. So I'm lucky on that front that I got one school and, and my kid is uh, going there and, and the feedback that I have is that he will be a half with Islamiyat or Diniyat, whatever you, you might want to call it. He would, be, he would be educated in that and, and he would be completing that in the next three years. So by 13, he will be a half -el. And I need to plan a future course of action for him as well. If you could just guide me on these two aspects, please. Uh, could you summarize your two points again, please? Well, uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm an MBA in finance and my ultimate goal is uh, to do PhD in Islamic finance. You have an MBA in? Finance. Finance. Conventional finance. Mm -hmm. And my second question is... Okay, um, just to deal with that one point. Sure. You want to do a PhD in Islamic finance. Yes. Yes. So, the PhD programs that I know of in uh, Islamic finance uh, offered by International Islamic University in Malaysia and... INSEF, is it? Uh, Institute uh, in Malaysia also. There's a few other institutions, but I don't, I don't know about here in Bahrain, do they offer a PhD in, in Islamic finance? I know they have some bachelor programs, but uh, is there? Dr. Sutan? No PhD is available. Huh? MBA only? Okay, so it means that, you know, you would have to go overseas, take some time off, register, and you, I would advise you first, of course, to look and see what is involved, because to go and do a PhD in Islamic finance, you know, having done a conventional finance on the bachelor's or master's level, you may have to take some additional courses to bring your uh, foundational knowledge uh, in place so that you can uh, do a proper uh, PhD program. So you need to plan uh, time off to go ahead and do that study. The other question concerning your child going to uh, an Islamic school, 
What was your concern there? Yeah, he's going to a school where they teach uh, uh, Islamic education as well as uh, secular education. And uh, the, the course curriculum there is, uh, apart from Islamiyat, uh, he's doing Hif. So uh, within three years, he will complete his Hif. And then he will continue only the secular education in that school. But parallelly, I want him to continue on Islamic education. He wanted him to continue in Islamic education. Yes. Um, I think uh, here in the, the country, country here, they don't have like madrasas really, uh, per se. So I don't think that's really an option here. You have to maybe put him back in school in, in, in your, your home country. But I, I, my advice really is that if you can have him attend programs, weekend programs, whatever, or evening programs to keep his Islamic uh, knowledge uh, growing, that's sufficient. While working with him in the modern, uh, you could call it uh, modern subjects of math, science, etc., that he's studying, and continue on uh, in, the, in the mode that he's currently studying. I, I don't, uh, I would not necessarily advise you to take him out and send him back home to your home country, you know, to study in a madrasa. Because uh, really the madrasas in general, the mode of education in them is quite uh, inferior, quite, quite low, you know, and, and the damage which is oftentimes done by unqualified teachers uh, beating the kids with sticks and all these other kinds of things, you know, the end results to a large degree are not very good. Um, so I think you just, uh, where you are, just try to increase the exposure, uh, have your child be around other children who are, or whose parents are like-minded so that they will be encouraged in that direction. Even the memorization of Quran, you have to be also careful with that because <clears throat> you may find, yes, he's supposed to memorize it in two to three years, but three years might come up and he still hasn't done it. You know, what do you do then? If he hasn't memorized it, it's, no, it's not a guarantee that he will memorize it. And also, you have to see how are they teaching it. Because again, if they're teaching it here, you know, beating the kids with sticks and things, you know, he might memorize the Quran and hate it in the end. So you have to be also very careful, you know, look into the methods which are being used because you're dealing with your own child and that child's Islam. And if you go to uh, the website called apostatesfromislam.com, you'll find many of the statements of those who left Islam uh, were based on malpractices in the Muslim world, the Muslim communities. So also be very careful in terms of how the child uh, is learning, even in the memorization of Quran. And as I would advise, if your child reaches the three-year period and he hasn't memorized half the Quran or whatever, then that's the point where you now focus on uh, the understanding of the Quran. Let the hif thing go. He's not among those who's going to memorize it all. You know, if you force him to, you know, he'll, he may end up hating the Quran. Focus on the meaning and, and make sure your goals are right. Because when you put him in the, the Quran memorization to uh, program, uh, it is common in, in much of the Muslim world that uh, a family, when they have children, they will take one child and expect that child to memorize Quran. You know, with the idea that if he memorizes the Quran, he'll be able to take the rest of the family by their hands into paradise. <laughs> so this is what they will always reserve this one child from the family to memorize Quran to save the rest of our family. But this mentality, and this approach, is actually distorted. It's a misunderstanding. It's misguidance, and you know what, what? What the learning of Quran actually means is lost. It's lost. It has become now a ritual, a blind ritual, which will not serve the purpose that we intended. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Um, in regard to the, you were asked about Islamic finance because Sheikh Bilal mentioned to you Malaysia. You know, because Malaysia has about two thirds of the Islamic investments in the world. 
So this is why the program is very popular, Islamic finance there, especially the Islamic International University of Malaysia. And if you're not able to leave the country for now, your circumstances don't allow you, I believe uh, there's another university in Malaysia, in, which is called Medina International University. And they have a program in the PhD in Islamic finance. But as Sheikh Bilal, Dr. Bilal said, that first they, you will have to be tested on a foundation in Islamic studies. So highly likely what I think is going to happen, they will require to take the courses at the master's level first, the foundation, which is usul al-fiqh, principles of fiqh, principles of the science of the hadith and the Quran. And once you have that background, then you can start working on the PhD uh, research with the professor. So that will be the first step, Allah alam, if, if you're not able to travel there. If I may just take some more time, uh, that was my specific question, like uh, if I want to go into PhD, uh, I would like to go some, through something like, I, I would get to IUU what, is, what it is offering, like a conventional graduate, if he wants to do MA in Islamic studies, he goes through a bridge called course BMAIS, BMAIS, as they call it. So if you have uh, some course like that, uh, which suits my requirements, I would like to yes, know that. Yes, Medina, and the good thing about Medina International University, it's, it's accredited as well by the, high, by the uh, uh, Commission of Higher Education in Malaysia. Alhamdulillah. So what you're getting is also accredited. And you have the option even to go the last year and attend on-site if you want your degree to be on-site. Um, that's one option to do, inshallah. And I believe, I know for sure, inshallah, Dr. Bilal Phillips has in his long-term vision to have PhDs in all these fields in the Islamic Online University um, in their unique method of teaching, alhamdulillah. So alhamdulillah, as the doctor said, all the options now are available to study anything. You just have to look for it and know where it is. Okay? Any field could be studied, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu uh, Question for Dr. Bilal. Uh, question for Dr. Bilal is that uh, Islamic Online University obviously has uh, lots of challenges. But what is the single biggest challenge that the Islamic Online University is having? And uh, second part of the question is what can students do to help promote the Islamic Online University? Let me start with the second one first. Uh, what students could do, uh, one of the things that we had hoped from this gathering was that uh, sufficient students would come <clears throat> that we could uh, try to set up a student committee though that the student body or some from the student body would be regularly engaged in promoting the Islamic Online University in the country as well as <clears throat> in helping the students themselves, because uh, students who sign up, etc., uh, run into problems. They need help. And uh, having a student committee available as a safety net for them is very, very important to help prevent the students from dropping out, because this is uh, a common phenomenon in online study that the dropout rates are high all around the world. In terms of the greatest challenge that the online university faces at this moment, uh, the greatest challenge, I guess, would be um, the expansion of the university into other disciplines, finding sufficient professors who are Islamically conscious to uh, deliver the topics, the, the various uh, subjects and courses in the disciplines right now, finding Islamically conscious professors. I remember when I put up on the website a request for uh, professors in, um, I think it was, was it information technology, I put it up on my website and I put up at the same, no, it was business administration, and I put up at the same time, you know, we wanted masters and PhDs with beards. And one brother said to me when I was just in Pakistan, he said, for the first time, having a beard 
was a plus. You know, <laughs> usually having a beard means you're not going to get the job. I'm the last. Very nice to see that. But a lot of other people reacted. Why beards? Why are you going to make this di distinction and so on and so on? And of course, you know, because the fact that the university has an image, it's the Islamic online university. You know, growing a beard is from the Sunnah, but it's from the Fard Sunnah. Uh, we have the right to make that a criteria for those who are going to teach with us. You know, so, uh, you know, it's not something people should be uh, upset about. But it, what it does is it limits, of course, the area who you can choose from. You know, who can you hire to deliver your courses for you. So, uh, I would say this is probably the biggest challenge we're faced right now. You know, it's finding uh, sufficient, uh, qualified uh, professors. Alhamdulillah, the visit to, to Pakistan opened up doors because for the first time I met large numbers. And most of the universities I went to were large numbers of, you know, professors who were Islamically conscious with beards. Uh, we had uh, without beards too, but at least the, the with beards condition, I could see the possibility of finding you know, a number of professors there. It was, uh, uh, of all the countries that I went to and, and visited universities, tried to find professors, uh, I saw the widest uh, availability of staff, of faculty there, mashallah. Sisters, what happened? Come on, we need someone to shall us speak up for the sisters. Yes, we have one. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my question is regarding the same what issue is going on right now um, about uh, child education, Islamic education. And I moved from USA just to think that I was thinking that I can get a better education, Islamic education for my kids, but it's the uh, opposite. Uh, but um, our, I'm thinking, I'm just wanted to teach my kids uh, strong in deen and dunya both. So. I'm planning to send my kids in a normal school, non-Islamic school, because uh, I just want to make them strong. And uh, other, and, and afternoon time, I want to teach them in a homeschooling Islamic education. But I'm really quite confused that how I'm going to go through which, like, uh, I don't have any curriculum, and I don't know which thing and you know, how I should go and you know, which level should I uh, start with the uh, like just example 99 names of Allah or I don't know I'm really confused you know how should I go um, uh, how I can teach her so I'm, I'm, uh, I just want some suggestion well I would say that uh, if you contact the networks of Islamic homeschoolers you've got a around the world, you know, virtually in every country you'll find Muslim families that have decided to go to homeschooling. And they have developed different curriculums which, uh, for teaching Islam in the home with the children for the different ages. Uh, you know, there's nothing standardized. Currently, we do hope in the future there will be. And Islamic Army University is working towards something of that nature. But for now, uh, I would say here in, in, in Bahrain, I'm sure there are, there are homeschoolers who are teaching at home. You need to get in touch with that network, meet with the other mothers who have this idea, etc. Uh, one of the things which we developed in Qatar um, eight years ago, uh, after parents were complaining about the non-existence of proper Islamic schools in the country, you know, and the need to set it up and the costs were so great and uh, it wasn't really possible. Uh, at that time, we, we, I suggested to them to do, you know, a Saturday program. So we developed at that point what, we, what came to be known as QMISAP, that is uh, the um, Qatar uh, Muslim Youth um, program, Saturday program, so it became Q MySAP. So that's been running for eight years now, males and females, young kids from, you know, um, kindergarten ages, well, um, actually way from grade one age, I think, yeah, grade one to up to grade 12. 
uh, where we have a program mixing uh, Islamic studies with sports. So they have, uh, they, we have professionals who come in and we teach them different sporting skills and uh, for half the time and half the time they would be taught Islamic study skills. So that uh, has been successful, alhamdulillah, it has run for eight years now. Uh, perhaps if you don't have something like that here in Bahrain, something you might want to consider. So at least that is additional uh, input for families whose children are going to uh, non-Islamic schools or even the Islamic schools to some degree. Just as a point of reference, sister, there is a Saturday school here that I'm, part, I'm, I'm actually a part of. It's called WISE, Weekend Islamic Schooling and Education. The, the venue is at Ibn al-Haytham School, so inshallah you could contact uh, Discover Islam or um, WISE and inshallah they'll be able to help you inshallah with that. It covers from grade 1 to all the way up to grade 12. We'll have another question from the sisters just to balance out the crowd here. Who's next from the sisters? Going okay. once. I don't see anybody, but maybe can I just ask the question we asked in the beginning again? How many, any, how many people here are students of IOU? You have studied or you, you were involved, etc at some point or another, are you interested in studying in IOU? Can you just put your uh, interest hand up? Interested would probably be, you know, uh, <laughs> Okay, so um, if we can pass a paper around, we have some uh, paper that can be circulated just to get the names, pass one over to the sister's side also, mm -hmm. to get the names of those who are interested, so we can give some kind of follow-up out of that, yeah. inshallah. And like Dr. Bilal said, the idea is to set up a network where, inshallah, you'd be you know, meeting regularly and promoting IOU. So keep that in mind also, inshallah. We have a question here? Yeah. If you have another pad there, please just pass that over to the sister's side. Huh? Do we, a pad of paper. Can you pass it over to the sister's side, please? Yes, it's really possible. Yeah. No, there's, there's one being circulated from the brother's side here. If those who would like to sign up, just put your names so they can get it. Can I ask, the, can I ask a question, please? Yes. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. Uh, my question is to both of the shiur here. Uh, on the point of extremism, uh, I know this is a, a cliched topic, you know, every time it comes to be asked the shiur, how can we tackle this, the, this, uh, this menace? But where actually is, is the problem? Is it in our homes? Is it in, uh, in society at large? Is it with our leadership? And by he here I am um, referring to an extremism of different sort. Uh, it's this extremism in which a group condemns another group, a Muslim group condemns another group just because they don't, uh, 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 you know, conform to their methodology. Just a slight difference. And this is a very subtle, uh, uh, you know, form of extremism that eventually, you know, develops into a very ugly thing. So, Sheikh, uh, is, if you may please, both. Because you've, you've traveled, you've been to different Muslim communities in the East and the West. Um, SubhanAllah, I mean, when we look at, when we want to know how extremism happens, we have to look at the root causes to see where this comes from. And one of the major reasons is the lack of proper knowledge. Okay, and this is what Sheikh Bilal said. And that's when that is lacking, then those ideas that are propagated by certain individuals or groups would find a place to it. So one of the ways to counter is to increase the quality of education that reaches the people that would serve to be like, um, uh, what do you call it, subhanAllah, the uh, uh, immunization, immunization, 
against these ideas. When, for example, people, when people have the proper knowledge about treating non-Muslims, you see, many times people learn wrong ideas or take some of the ayat out of context to understand the relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims. And they take ayat that were revealed in the context of a battle and use it outside in the context of non-Muslims who are living in certain areas peacefully among Muslims. And at the same time, one of the causes often is if, if you look at the many cases of people who took down that path, you would see that there was certain areas in their life that were not going correctly, whether it was discrimination, whether it was the rejection by society from their parents or from others, okay? sometimes it's psychological issues that they have that are not dealt with. And we have seen the recent case, which is now on the media, of someone who was, had a very normal life but they were intimidated so much until they were pushed into that path. Okay. So by providing people an environment where they can practice Islam peacefully, that's one way to tackle it. And then again, this is a whole topic. Extremism, what is the types of extremism and how can we tackle each of them? Okay. So even answering a question is not going to cover it properly. But the, and I believe, inshallah, Sheikh Bilal could, uh, Dr. Bilal could add more points to this about the causes of extremism and how we eradicate them. But even among the grouping of the Muslims, the groups who attack each other and all that, by learning, if the person believes they are correct, they would learn what's the proper manners of communicating these ideas. When we have fiqh differences, what fiqh differences are valid and what are invalid? And when there is an invalid opinion, how to tackle that? How to talk to people who have that opinion and convince them and do da'wah and looking at the Qur'an. Looking at how Musa alayhi salam himself, how he spoke to Fir'aun, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed them to speak to the tyrant of the tyrants of his time. So it's a long process and it starts... It's, it starts from the education in the schools, it starts from the parenting at home, paying attention to these children, okay? When they are, and then the youth especially, because most of these things, the most vulnerable group, the group that everyone is, is uh, observing now, and especially the intelligence in the countries, is the group from the teenage age to about the 30s, early 30s, okay? Where, Usually, extremism could happen out of these age groups, okay? but it's more likely in these groups when something wrong in the development causes the person to try to force people to accept their ideas. And going based on slogans, you know, the, the groups who come and raise slogans that now we need to implement Sharia. Okay? And they don't learn, for example, how the Prophet ﷺ himself took 23 years to implement Sharia fully. When they want quick change, quick and decisive change, okay? even though throughout Islamic history, change always take, took, take time. Okay? It was rarely ever in any era of history decisive in one shot like that. No. Okay? It's a process that takes several years and sometimes decades that we achieve. Dr. Bilal, if you would like to add something. Well, just the point of uh, tolerance. Tolerance to different, different ideas. The great Imams differed. Abu Hanifa differed from Imam Malik. Imam Malik from Imam Laith. Imam Shafi from Imam Malik, though he was a student. Imam Ahmed from Imam Shafi, though he was a student. I mean, they, they differed. They disagreed. They, dis they, they discussed. They, they argued, they brought the evidences, etc. And in the end, they went along. They did not cut themselves off from the other, declare one to be a deviant or off the path or out of Islam or whatever. They didn't do that. That wasn't their way. The early generation wasn't like that either. But unfortunately, you know, as uh, Sheikh Walid has mentioned, that people take things out of context. You have some books like the the Aqidah of uh, 
al Barbahari, right? This, I think, was the single most destructive book in the uh, rise of uh, Islam in the West, and especially in the UK, where this book now, which spoke about people who were to be executed by the Muslim ruler for their disbelief, who had deviated to the point of execution, where the ruler was no longer executing them, how are you going to deal with such people in the society? So they, he advised, if you see them coming, go on the other side of the road. Don't sit with them. Don't shake their hands. Don't. So now they took this for these people of that time, in that context, and they're applying it now to the average Muslim. The average Muslim has a, some problem in his aqidah, in his belief. He's, hey, who doesn't have some error in their belief? So now he takes that, he finds one error, all of a sudden, you know, he's applying barbahari to you. So the end of it is that people became so extreme. You know, they split the ranks. Until this day, there's still people who are pro propagating that dawah of hate. That's what I call it. The dawah of hate. Hatred. And as, as a general rule, if you find people are calling you to hate other Muslims, then know this dawah is deviated. Because the dawah of the Prophet ﷺ was one of love. Winning hearts, winning minds, winning souls. It's a dawah of love, not a dawah of hatred. Though you should hate what Allah hates and love what Allah loves. But this is not directed at the people themselves, but at what they hold of their beliefs. This is what is despicable in the sight of Allah. But because if you are going to hate disbelievers, you can't give dawah. They will see it in your face, they will hear it in your words, in your body, you know, your body uh, language. They will read it. You can't give dawah successfully. Jazakumallah khair. You know, the, this conversation is uh, really enjoyable and we, unfortunately time is up. So we'd have, we'll have to, uh, you know, call it a night. I'd like to remind you all to um, come to the event tomorrow at Isa Cultural Hall, which is the hall right next to Al Fatih, by the way. So our event tomorrow starts at 8 o'clock. Sheikh Walid will be talking for an hour from 8 till 9, and then Dr. Bilal will be taking over from um, 9 till 10. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all there. Please make sure to bring your family and friends along. It's a free event, uh, open to public. Once again, we'd like to thank our mashayikh for giving us the time to spend quality time with them and for allowing us to ask you open questions. And we, inshallah, wish you all the best tomorrow, bi'idhnillah. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.